we want to thank you all for being here. Um, this is uh, this is something that was of interest. A lot of people requested that we put together a forum on how what happened in terms of hunger legislation and the recently concluded New Mexico state legislative session. Um, and there was a special session afterwards, but they didn't do didn't deal directly with some of the issues that we we looked at. Um, and so we um, have very three very good people. I uh, on our panel, our our moderator um, Jane Braithworth wasn't able to join us today because she had a last minute emergency. So so um, Ellen Bulo and Judy Messel and I will be sharing the moderating. Um, well, before before we move on, I I want to recognize a couple of guests. Uh, um, um, Diana Sprague from the Food Bank of Eastern New Mexico, welcome. Um, I guess a couple of other people from food banks who had signed up but weren't apparently I haven't been able to come. But we thank Sherry Hooper for sending out the word out to the New Mexico Association of Food Banks and some folks from the Food Depot. Um, advocacy committee are here too so we we welcome all of you and tim davis from the new mexico center on law and poverty we we welcome you too um to before we go on i think as we are we're a faith-based organization we start with a prayer so i'm going to turn it over to to mary singleton and she's got she's got a reflection prepared for us Thanks, Carlos. It, it's, it's not truly a prayer. It's some thoughts I wanted to share about being hunger advocates. And I want us to think about how this is not a project that gets wrapped up at the end of a session. It goes on year after year after year. Mm -hmm. And do we sometimes become weary with the fact that it's never done? I want to focus on that just for a minute. The 60-day legislature is over, but we've been Zoomed and emailed for 60 days and maybe don't even feel like we've accomplished that much. So we need to recharge. And I wanna just mention ways that we can do that. I think we've each probably had an Easter or a Passover celebration through our faith community. I wanna share that we did have a group together here in beautiful Truchas with our fellow members from Chimayo, which was very special. I want to thank Carlos because year after year, he's been there prodding us and that's kept our enthusiasm going. And finally, I want to thank Sherry because that video, Hungry to Learn, just knocked my socks off. You know, I went to college in the 50s. It wasn't like that. We lived in a dorm. We had you know, meal tickets. I was so impressed that we have young people who are so hungry to learn. They will commute long distances, get up at ungodly hours, and then go without a square meal. So I just want us to recharge, think about that need. Be glad that we have each other to come together and to invigorate our, our interest. That's my devotion. Amen. Thank you, Mary. Uh, a couple of um, housekeeping things. Um, if you have any questions, please um, write them in the chat. Um, we'll not, we're going to have a question and answer session at, at the very end. And, and Kathy Fries will be asking the questions on your behalf. I think that'll make the, 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 our event go a lot smoother. Um, and also, uh, what I'd like to do is um, as I mentioned before, um, Ellen and myself and, and Judy Messel are gonna be um, sharing the moderating. And so we, we're each taking a section, but what we're gonna do is ask our, the, 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 per the persons who are actually a, in charge of that section to introduce themselves. And so I, I am starting, I, I just wanna say a brief word about our first panelist and that's Pam Roy. Pam has done, has spent many, many years on, the, on, on legislation related to food and hunger. I knew her back from way back when Governor Richardson did the, um, 
the the hunger um, it committees but way way back and back in the in the in the nineties and so we yeah, so so Pam is a perfect person to start with because she's got a the broad picture on everything. I wish I want to turn it to you, Pam. It's all yours. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Carlos. Thank you, and. Um, I just, I love being here with Carlos because, um, you know, he's uh, just brings such a breath of fresh air and strength and love and wisdom to the work and, um, and to the idea that we all and all of you are part of this, you know, uh, can find ways to end hunger and, and poverty as well in New Mexico and, and in our communities. And so just want to say thanks for everything that you all do in your own ways uh, and uh, as a collective, as a coalition. Um, and I will let you know, I'm actually here uh, being joined by Hercules, my 16 pound cat who um, now got hair. So if I start to look like I'm itching, it's <laughs> got hair floating everywhere. So um, Hercules is with us too. Uh, so really thank you for the invitation to be here. And so Pam Roy, as Carlos mentioned, and I am the executive director of Farm to Table, a nonprofit organization. We're based outside of Santa Fe, yet statewide in our, in our approach. And we're structured a little bit differently because we actually are home to, and it was part of our reason to structure this way, to um, the New Mexico Food and Agriculture Policy Council, which is about to celebrate its 20th year. We're one of the longest ongoing food and agriculture food policy councils in the country one of the first to get started as well. And just a little bit about what that looks like. It is, um, we're not a single issue uh, advocacy organization or coalition. We are a multiples of hunger and hunger has been, you know, the work around hunger has been at our table ever since the inception. But hunger, food, agriculture, health, um, economic options for our state, uh, and um, education, how and how all these pieces intersect as much as possible. And we are also a coalition, a part of it is they were structured that we are both agencies, individuals, and organizations. So agencies are at the table for the very reason so that we understand and we can learn more about how if we roll out programs through a legislative process how does that agency then have to manage and make sure that program rolls out into communities? Um, and it has been a really, really important structure to be living, living in and living with all this time because we've gained such incredible relationships with the agencies over the years. Um, and I'll speak to that because Representative Stansberry's bill, House Bill 207, really speaks to the importance of us all working together um, out in our communities and inside government, whether it be at the very local level, um, uh, the municipality level, tribal level, state level, and even federal too. So just a little bit of a breadth there. And then we also are home to um, what's called New what's, what started as Farm to School and is now a state agency or uh, initiative called Farm uh, New Mexico Grown. And I'll share a little bit more about why that's important and with some of the legislative outcomes. So just thinking about, um, and, and um, you know, I wanna say thanks to Elizabeth, where are you, was it Elizabeth? Um, or, um, sorry, it was Mary, Mary saying, we've been working on hunger all this time, you know, and it is still really prevalent here in New Mexico, always falling in these unfortunate statistics around it. And I wanna to say to all of you and my dear friend, Sherry Hooper and our food assistance programs um, for the more than uh, monumental lift over this last year uh, to make sure that everybody um, has, is food secure as much as possible, that they're cared for, they know that people care about them. And it isn't just about the food, it's about the people who are out there on the front lines. And I can't say enough, <laughs> never be able to say enough about how much I appreciate what you all do and the collective effort there. Um, and from that, not just that, but many things we've been learning for a long time and Sherry and I will see many of our dreams come true soon. <laughs> we have lots of, we've been talking about what are those relationships, right? So um, hunger is not siloed, um, neither is where our food is produced. 
um, and neither is where we get it from and how it's consumed and farmers themselves who are actually growing it for us. Um, and they too are at great risk and stand on a front line all the time. And this year, as you know, are facing um, the major, major water shortages, of course. Uh, and, um, and to say that is that agriculture in New Mexico is our third largest economic sector. So many might not know that. Yet 97% of what we grow raised in New, Me and raised in New Mexico is exported out of the state. Um, and the pandemic shed a very large light on the importance of what local means and what it means to grow and expand what we're doing in New Mexico, um, creating more market opportunities, making sure that not only do those who are at risk, um, you know, be able to eat local as well, um, but also that uh, local is in not just our restaurants and our grocery stores, but our institutions where we have federal, state, local uh, food and nutrition programs. So to that, one of the long range uh, pieces of work that uh, the New Mexico Food and Ag Policy Council is focused on are the intersections between hunger, where our food comes from, agriculture, and the economic options and opportunities there as well. And this year we saw numerous um, initiatives that were really exciting at the legislature, I'll bring up a couple, and then also really that growth. And I'll use the example, and Carlos asked, the New Mexico Grown Program. Many of you know what we've been doing for a long time, and that is to look at nutrition and where do we, where do we meet where are we working on nutrition with populations, right? So New Mexico grown produce in school meals. The idea is to make sure that children are getting and students are getting the freshest options. And then New Mexico farmers are actually building up business opportunities. And we're keeping that money at home in our state. And those dollars then multiply. This year we've been able, and we did a pilot project last year with the state uh, for aging and long-term, with aging long-term services, and um, figuring out how to build this program out into senior services. And thanks to Senator Liz St uh, Stefanix, Representative Gail Armstrong, and others who really care deeply, deeply about what's happening for our seniors, um, the, the uh, legislature passed $97,600 and potentially another $50,000 for us to establish a statewide program Every one of those dollars will be turned out to providers, be food service directors school, for, for senior centers to be able to buy local. What's really exciting about that idea of working with agencies and not hoisting something onto them is that Aging and Long-Term Services is so excited about this program that not only they're going to ask their providers, there's over 200 senior service providers, including in tribal communities, um, to, um, to apply for the local funds, and that's not a lot of money. They're going to put into their, um, their plans for every senior service center provider to um, purchase at least 5% New Mexico grown um, out of other funds, like federal funds, some of the federal funds, their county funds, and things like that. So they are very committed to that idea that seniors get the freshest local produce. And when we rolled out the pilot program last year, seniors were ecstatic and it was during the pandemic when much of that food was being delivered, home delivered, and we were able to get fresh, beautiful salad greens and, and early tomatoes to seniors through that program. So really excited to have an agency that's interested in that. And, and interested in the growth. And the second part of that is because we've been working on this for so long, um, now we have Aging Long-Term Services, Public Education Department, Early Childhood Education Department, Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Health who've created an interagency task force uh, to focus on um, this program being solidified across all these agencies and across generations. And as our senior population is our fastest growing population in New Mexico, we see this program uh, will expand probably pretty rapidly, um, especially with an agency that cares so much. 
the early childhood education department also, we did have an introductory bill, uh, didn't get any funding on it, but um, we have uh, some philanthropic dollars that will actually be able to help us get that started and do several pilot projects around the state. And we'll do as much to intertwine those. So that's one part of it. And just a couple other things, because I know I need to pass the baton for sure. Um, several other things that are associated with that. Um, one bill that, again, just didn't quite, it was on the schedule for the House to finish, to pass it, was um, House bill, well, anyway, it doesn't matter, it's called the Healthy Food Financing Act. And this is, in, in La Semilla Food Center, which is an incredible organization based in southern New Mexico, in Anthony, New Mexico, but also does a lot of really policy, important policy work. Um, focused on the idea, and this is a, it's a federal program as well, but for the state to initiate a program that would provide um, funding investments, financial investments into things like rural grocery stores in areas where a, a national distributor or a national store chain would not, would not um, exist and or is pulled out of, and that a local bank would not finance, but that it provides the idea, not only the idea, but to create uh, and, and provide the support for local communities to be able to have their own grocery stores in places that are very small, very rural, potentially on tri in tribal communities. And the emphasis of this bill is for those funds to be prioritized um, in, in BIPOC communities, underserved, and as I mentioned, rural, um, and that it is organizations and businesses that are um, people of color led uh, that get first choice to be able to apply for the program. Um, so it was amazing to watch this bill move through the process because of the way it's written. It was somewhat untraditional as a bill because it really focused on what it means, what underserved potentially means and what it means to be equitable and what racial equity and social and economic equity really mean to our communities. And what it means to lift us out of hunger and poverty by putting the investments in the right places. So the good news is, is that even though the act didn't pass, the Economic Development Department and many partners can continue to move on this program. It was $100,000 that was actually put in it, it it, that is in place for the Economic Development Department to get this off the ground. And the state agency can apply for federal fundings out of the Healthy Food Financing Initiative up to $2 million a year to bring home to New Mexico. So whether we as a state invest in this program or not, the state can actually um, apply for funding to bring home and invest in New Mexico. So a couple of examples of um, really great, incredible work on the ground in community work, some really innovative things that really focused on making sure that everybody counts in the state. Um, and then building out programs like New Mexico Grown, the idea of really making the best nutritious foods happen. And then um, really kudos to, to everybody, Representative Ferrari, Representative Stansberry, who also worked on House Bill 133 uh, to, to your point earlier about um, getting New Mexico or, or getting um, uh, uh, you know, food into our colleges for those who are, again are facing hunger and food insecurity. And there's $100,000 that's been put towards that um, legislatively. So maybe I'll stop there and we can talk about some of the other things that have come up and circle back around on some of that if you want. Muted. That's okay. No. I can, I can, you can tell, I can talk all day. So. <laughs> there are other good things that pass, so, and they are associated. But it's in perfect timing, Representative Stansberry is with us. So, um, uh, and Representative Stansberry, I'm not sure if you heard those sharing out a little bit, uh, but said that um, House Bill 207, the Hunger, Food, and Farming Act, um, was a really great way to showcase the importance of 
um, interagency and um, that private sector work and all of us working collectively in the intersections interfaces. Um, and I didn't go into it much because I know that that's where you're here, but kind of laid a little bit of the landscape. Yes. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. And my privilege is to pre uh, present Representative Stansberry, who is running for our House of Representatives in District 1 and took time from her busy schedule to be with us tonight. We really appreciate that. And she took the work from the New Mexico First Work Group for Food, Hunger, and Egg. And she is our legislative guru because she brought this bill to fruition. And Representative Stansberry, I'd like to talk tonight about three basic bills, okay? The first one is the strategy and process behind House Bill 207, the Food, Hunger, and Ag Bill, and the reasons behind the decision to table the bill and use junior money to fund some of the initiatives via allocation to cabinet departments. And this was done to save the bill, we know, but what is the future for coming legislative sessions? The second question is, what role does House Bill 2, the budget bill, ultimately play in bills introduced in the state legislature? And then again, as Pam has, rec has talked about, House Bill 133, could you also mention the fate of the legislation that dealt with this college hunger and emergency funding for food banks? Thank you very much, Representative. Well, hi there. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you this evening. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a few minutes late. I got a phone call just as I was logging on that I had to take. Um, well, let's go ahead and start first with House Bill 207. I think many, if not all of you were involved in the development of that bill and or were tracking that bill or participating in it in, it in some way. And um, I want to just slightly recast the way that Ellen um, introduced it because um, the bill, we didn't save the bill. Um, we had um, in-depth conversations with the governor's office and leadership about how to best move forward to carry out the work. And um, so it wasn't that the bill was gonna die and it was a last ditch effort. It was nothing like that. We had in-depth conversations with Dr. Scrace in the governor's office and leadership about whether it made sense for the bill to move forward in this first year of implementation as it was currently configured or whether it made sense for the agencies to get some money appropriated and actually go and do the first year of work and then come back and pass the bill next year. And that was ultimately the course that was agreed to by the administration with um, the legislature. So I, I wanna like sort of allay people's anxiety that somehow the bill was killed or there was some master plan or strategy, which there really wasn't. And I think um, what I can do is to try to help explain some of the dynamics around the budget itself and how that affected all of the bills, not just the hunger bills, but all of the bills in the entire legislature, because I think it will help kind of shed some light on what people saw and what moved forward. The other sort of opening comment that I'd like to make about the process and procedure and strategy is that um, you know, in my excitement about getting this bill filed and having this amazing coalition um, coalesce around it and support this bill, you know, I may not have completely tempered expectations that we may not get it passed in one legislature. It is extremely rare to pass a really comprehensive game changing systems bill in one legislature. Many of the bills that passed this session, people have been working on for a decade or more. So um, it's very, very common to take many years for a bill, especially a bill that's trying to tackle something as important as hunger to pass. So, um, so although I was frustrated at times about how things were moving in the, in the session, I, don't, I guess from my perspective, it wasn't completely unexpected, if that makes sense. And so I actually feel happy and victor victorious about the outcome of what happened with our bill, um, but I haven't had the opportunity to debrief with everyone. So I'm grateful um, for the opportunity tonight. 
So just, I know many of you have been involved since the very beginning, but I think it's worth kind of rewinding um, and then reflecting on kind of how the bill came to be and then um, how it interfaced in the session. So as probably many of you rec recall, we started meeting in the summer of 2019. Um, and I actually first reached out via um, Donna Lochner, who is a volunteer who works with me, um, to many of you all because I had had lunch with the speaker's chief of staff and I know Sherry and a number of people had reached out to the speaker's office about the desire to do something in a comprehensive manner to work on hunger. And this coalition was also working with Representative Ferrari on putting together a coalition on hunger. And sort of all the pieces started to come together over the course of 2019. We did some great work in the 2020 session, especially around the budget and um, the um, school lunch bill that we worked on with um, App, uh, New Mexico Appleseed and the governor. And um, of course, then our work folded into this really important response work that we started doing um, as the pandemic was unfolding in March and April of this time frame last year. And in fact, I just myself took a little mini retreat the last couple of days to recover from the Democratic primary in the CD1 race. And um, since this is an interfaith group, I went and stayed at the Christ Monastery in the desert with some colleagues. And um, the monastery is not open right now, but some colleagues of mine were installing some science equipment to monitor the river. And I was reflecting on how this time last year, all of us were in crisis mode, trying to figure out how to get food delivered to communities that suddenly were having food access issues and how incredibly stressful, but also how incredibly powerful that time was. And for me personally, not having done that, that kind of or scale of work before, um, it was life-changing for me. It really affected me um, personally and spiritually in a lot of ways. I'm getting emotional thinking about it because it's so, you know, it's such profound work. Um, so, you know, as the work of the pandemic response continued through the summer and, and our food system was beginning to sort itself out, thanks very much to many of the people on this call, um, you know, I think all of us um, started to realize like the depths of how our food system is really broken. And um, I've been giving a lot of thought to it kind of, um, philosophically over the last year. And I don't know if I've shared this with um, many of you before, but I actually went to graduate school to study sociology in a program at Cornell that was famous for food systems theory. And I didn't actually go there to study food systems, but my advisor there was actually quite famous for studying food systems. And so I was sort of inculcated in that, um, in that theory and, and body of thought while I was studying there. So I've been thinking a lot about food systems over the last year and thinking a lot about how the pandemic laid bare, you know, this strange quandary that we, our agricultural system is completely set up on the commercial end for export of food to benefit financially our commercial farmers um, while we have food shortages and inability to actually deliver food to hungry people on the other side of the spectrum. And, um, and you know, that that's not something that just happened by accident. It's something that is really the development of the 20th century of our food system. And it's, I think the, you know, the pandemic really laid bare how those threads had been frayed in our, in our economy here in New Mexico. And so one of the things I've been thinking about a lot this year is how the pandemic created opportunities to repatriate our food system and how it's created opportunities for agricultural farmers to actually provide, you know, food directly to our people here in the state and how it made crystal clear things that many of you had been working on for years, but for policymakers like me, much clearer that like it's systemic, it's institutional, it's structural, it's um, tied obviously to income inequality and poverty, but also to a lack of basic infrastructure, transportation, cold storage, 
and the ability to move food to the right places at the right times um, for the right purposes. And so um, I see the bill that came together in 207 is the best thinking that um, we were able to put together as we were all processing, you know, all of this thinking about our food system. So um, I think, you know, structurally, some of the challenges that we faced taking 207 into the legislative session is that, um, and this was due to my own um, capacity issues. Um, we, I was late in getting the draft submitted. You know, we didn't file the draft, I think, until the second week of the session. And so we were trying to both work through technical details in the draft with the administration and the agencies, as well as other stakeholders who, who had not reviewed the draft before. Um, and some of our um, commercial ag folks in particular and the Chamber of Commerce and some of the other um, sort of important stakeholders in the legislature. Um, so I think that, you know, filing the bill late um, caused some difficulties in getting it through the process. I think that had we've been able to have the bill finalized and work through all the details with the administration and all of the stakeholders, you know, in November and December, and potentially even had it heard in an interim committee, though it would have been more socialized. And so we would have come into the session um, with people sort of more prepared to wrap their mind around the bill and to work out any final details on it. At the end of the day, the feedback that I got from the administration and was that they were really excited about and that the governor is obviously very committed to addressing hunger issues and particularly focused on childhood hunger, but that there was so much in the bill that it was trying to solve everything in the food system in the bill that it was a lot to wrap your mind around and to figure out how would we begin to implement this and how would we have sufficient resources to really begin to implement it? And in the drafting, we tried to address that by creating a series of reporting requirements. And I think because people hadn't had the opportunity to really digest the full scope of what we were trying to accomplish with these legal mechanisms, um, for example, you know, authorizing agencies to use their infrastructure, um, which wasn't just a reporting requirement, but an actual um, mandate now on these agencies, um, that it was just like under the time compression of the legislature during a pandemic, it was sort of too much to process um, in a couple of weeks and get through the process. I also think that, um, the, you know, I don't know, but I do think that there was a political overlay in this session. The minority was particularly not in a mood to be bipartisan during this session. And it wasn't just this bill, we saw it across the board in the final weeks of the session. Um, we were told that minority leadership told majority leadership they wanted nothing in the session and therefore we're not gonna cooperate on anything. Um, and so I know there were some bipartisan bills and there were some bills that passed that were both Republican and Democrat. But I think that the, I think that, that po political stance made it hard to advance things that normally would be very bipartisan um, activities. Now, why that was the case, I have no idea. I really don't. You know, there were moments where I was like, I, I asked myself, is it because I'm running for Congress? Is that at play here? Maybe it was. But then I saw that there was the same tactics being taken on other bills that I had nothing to do with. So I do think that there was a real breakdown of bipartisanship this session that also affected um, how some of the issues that we work on just didn't advance. Um, and then the final thing that I'll talk about is the budget piece of it. So budgeting this session in particular was extremely difficult. I'm trying to think of the right word. Chaotic, difficult, incongruous in a way because of the pandemic and what happened to the economy and oil and gas prices. So I'll just kind of step back. 
and describe kind of two parallel things so that I can put it all in context at the end. So during the normal, the normal budget process in the state legislature, during the interim period, so from the time the session adjourns until the next session, the Legislative Finance Committee, which is the bicameral bipartisan committee that does our budget, meets during the interim and they hear the budgets of the agencies. And in September, the governor submits her budget to the legislature. They have a whole series of hearings on it. And then the Legislative Finance Committee puts together what they call the framework, the budget framework that they pass during the interim. And then that budget framework is what comes into the House with House Bill 2. So um, by the time the budget framework arrives in January in the form of House Bill 2, a lot of macro decisions have already been made about the budget. And those macro decisions are um, things about like what the assumptions are about state revenues, a lot of the revenues are based on oil and gas prices and um, economic activity that's going to generate uh, gross receipts tax and income tax. Um, and also the budget framework that the LFC adopts during the interim also kind of sets the um, macro budget for the agencies and their sub programs. So the reason why that's really important to understand is that by the time the budget gets to the legislature, many of the big decisions have already been made. So it's possible to influence things during the session kind of on the micro level in terms of like a little tweak here, a few extra 100K there, but it is really, really difficult during the session to actually get any significant amount of money added or moved within the budget framework because that LFC framework has already been adopted. So. The thing that is important to understand about that is that during the interim, it's really important to get budget proposals in front of people who serve on LFC to work with the agencies to make sure that the governor's office is requesting that funding as it goes into the LFC framework, because that's where really the big decisions get made. So that's the normal process. Now the overlay of what happened this year, which was completely chaotic. So as you guys all recall, I'm sure we started January of 2020 last year on the calendar year. We came into the session with the largest budget surplus ever in New Mexico's history. And that was because there had been this huge oil and gas boom in the Permian. And so a massive amount of money had come into the state's coffers, both in terms of money that was available for spending in the operational budget, as well as billions of dollars that went into our reserves. And so in the uh, session last year, in the 2020 session, the legislature decided to plus up the agency's operational budgets around education, hunger initiatives, a bunch of different things because we had surplus money to do that. And we also had all this cash sitting in our reserve accounts. So then the pandemic hit. And in addition to that, we had an OPEC oil crisis on um, uh, you know, oil and gas prices and oil and gas went negative at one point. There was just a glut in the market. And so oil prices crashed and there was a huge panic in the state because we were like, oh my gosh, we just increased the budget for all these programs. Now we're gonna have to completely recalibrate the budget um, so that we don't violate the constitution and go bankrupt. So we called a special session in June of last year to recalibrate the budget to deal with the financial crisis. And as you guys probably recall, um, Congress at the time was also negotiating a relief and recovery package. And so the state budget people, I'm sorry if I'm getting so technical, but it really plays out into what happened this session. So the state budget people basically made some highly educated and what turned out to be excellent um, but cautious um, risks in the budget that we did in June, where we shaved the budgets down across all the operational budgets 
And we ended up pulling money out of our reserve accounts to make sure that we kept those agencies as whole as possible. And the budget staff made that calculated risk the Congress would ultimately come through and we wouldn't have to eviscerate the state agencies in order to keep the budget whole. And they were right. So thank God they were right. We did still cut the agencies back, but what's important to understand is that that cutback mostly was not into bone. It basically took them back to where they were before January when we plus them up. So basically we kind of ended up back where we started last year, which was not very good because most of our agencies had been cut a lot over the last decade, but, um, but they were kind of static as compared to the previous year. We then had headed into the fall, Congress passed a recovery package or a relief package. And um, part of that relief package um, was to extend, ultimately extend the availability of relief money. And so what we did was we held another special session in the fall, wherein we reallocated some of that federal relief money. And that's how we were able to meet that $5 million request that the food banks had been working on for months. And we were able to reallocate some funding. So we headed into this January session under the premise that we were still going to have um, still be in somewhat of an economic recession with somewhat depressed oil prices and um, with the potential of a Biden administration relief package. But by the time we came into the January session, we brought in the framework that the LFC had been working on during the interim. And those assumptions that we were still going to be in an economic slump had been built into the framework because as I was telling you guys, that framework gets set. So we get into session, turns out oil prices go up again. All of a sudden we have a recovery in the oil markets and all of a sudden we have a surplus in money all of a sudden at the beginning of the session. And so both the governor's office and the legislative leadership suddenly had to decide what do we do with this budget surplus which we know is highly unstable and we have no idea what's gonna happen. And again, the staff recommended, we're gonna probably have another big recovery package coming down the pike, which we did, right? And also another big relief package, which is likely to come maybe in the next three to six months. And so rather than plus up our agency operational budgets um, in areas that we think we're gonna get federal money, um, they decided to shore up really top priorities of the governor, really top priorities of the um, legislature. And I know I'm getting like way in the weeds here, <laughs> sorry. Um, um, and focus on things that we knew there wouldn't be federal money for, if that makes sense, because we know there's gonna be billions of dollars in federal money coming out. So um, so there was still this like weird mishmash happening during this budget session where we're erring on the side of caution on the operational budgets of the agencies, but we have a surplus of cash that we wanna spend now to stimulate the economy. So the decision was made by the legislative leadership and the governor to do a junior bill, which they thought they would never do again, but they decided to do that to basically provide a cash infusion into essentially stimulating the economy and funding priorities of the legislature and the governor. So that's why we did the junior bill. And they were able to plus up some of the operational budgets to get them back to where we were last January. So it wasn't like crazy stuff. It was like, how do we get back to like some of the major initiatives we were trying to do last year that got zeroed out? And also assuming like we're gonna get another federal package that's gonna include money for food, money for um, schools, money for state, or state, local and tribal governments. And then also because we have this big cash infusion, um, to put money into infrastructure rather than, um, um, you know, because that stimulates the economy. So 
in the context of all of that madness, <laughs> um, it was recommended to legislators that rather than trying to pass big initiative bills that would require a significant increase in operational funding for agencies year after year, that instead we pursue the budget funding through the junior bill for the year one of this year to get us through while we're waiting for the economy to stabilize. So I know I just gave you guys a lot of information, but hopefully that provides like the bigger context as to why so much of what we pursued was through the junior bill. It was really because we were operating against this much bigger um, instability in our economy and state revenues and decisions that were made about how to um, address priorities now but also not tie our, our um, agencies in such a way that it's unsustainable long-term. So in that massive context I just gave you, um, the food and hunger bill that we put forward as the agencies were evaluating it and the governor was evaluating, not she herself, but staff were evaluating it. There, basically their assessment was, is this is really important work. We wanna lead this work. You know, Dr. Scrace and I had a number of conversations. He was really excited about it. He is already thinking about staff he wanted to put in charge of it. He is like, this is really, you know, something that we need to be championing and really laying the groundwork for. But let's figure out how we can actually get money put in the budget so that we can come to the table in good faith and do the work on our end, but not end up saddling the state with an unfunded mandate year after year before we've kind of done the initial groundwork. So the reason why we pursued um, junior bill funding was to provide the funding for HSD to pay staff and buy out their time and work with the Department of Agriculture to do this year one work so that we can refine the bill, we can have the state actually engaging actively with our working groups and actually advance the work um, structurally through the state. So that's why I feel like we won. <laughs> because in the midst of all this chaos, we changed the conversation and we actually got money appropriated for the state and also for our agencies to prioritize this work. And I spoke to the governor's staff a couple of days ago and they made sure that the funding ended up in the junior bill. So um, again, I think we should declare victory. We haven't solved hunger yet. Um, we haven't figured out how to repatriate our food system yet, but we are well on the path. <laughs> and I feel really, really good about it. And it couldn't have happened without all of you and a very complicated story. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Representative Stansberry. That was, I took great notes. <laughs> that was, was excellent. It really gave us the picture that we needed to see. And with that, I will move on to introduce Kurt Rager. Kurt is the Director of Lutheran Advocacy Ministry in New Mexico, which has more than a 35 year history of doing ecumenical advocacy and, and, and collaborating with um, advocates in the secular sphere as well, um, and and really a good legacy in the in the state of New Mexico. Kurt, a couple of years ago, stepped seamlessly into the position and has been just doing a fantastic job. We're going to ask him to talk about some of the bills that don't have um, anything to do directly with feeding people, but they certainly work on some of the issues that prevent um, people from moving out of poverty. One he'll talk about, I think, is the, the effort to regulate payday loans more. And another one is the House Joint Resolution Number One, Early Childhood Education. And then just talk about the nature of faith-based advocacy in a legislative session as sector. So with that, Kurt, I will pass it on to you. 
Well, I'm not sure what else needs to be said. I've been following two outstanding <laughs> speakers and uh, they've said it all. So uh, I think it's time for dinner. Uh, no, I jest. Um, well, thank you. I'm, it's, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm pleased to be part of this coalition. And actually, Judy, it's been about a year <laughs> since. Well, let's see. I, I came on board in December of 2020. So in many respects, I really do feel like I'm the new kid on the block. And uh, even though I was born and raised in this state, I was gone for a while. And a lot of the players have changed. And uh, so as I've been a part of numerous coalitions over this last year, I've just been incredibly impressed and often in awe of the people who are working not only in hunger and poverty kinds of issues, but all the other issues that we uh, that we work on as well. And, and certainly being a part of the, uh, the, the coalition that New Mexico first put together that Pam Roy was part of and Representative Stansbury and so many others, uh, much of my participation in that was sitting back watching and learning and just being impressed with the, uh, the, the um, uh, not just the commitment, but the knowledge and the perspectives and the, the desire to bring all of this together to look at it from a big picture. So, um, but uh, in terms of, I guess we just, we don't have a whole lot of time left. So I'm gonna sort of pare down what I wanted to say. Uh, we work in about uh, our advocacy agenda this year covered six major areas, which included affordable housing, uh, family sustaining income, hunger, healthcare, tax policy, criminal justice, and then some kind of a hodgepodge of racial equity kinds of issues, uh, elections, those kinds of things. And so overall, we were covering about 80 to 90 bills. Uh, some, the, the group of course that we were really focused on was much smaller, those that were really gaining traction and that were pretty important to us, but we were tracking close to hundred bills in total. Uh, the two bills that you mentioned, Judy, SB 66 and HDR1, uh, again, as Representative Stansbury pointed out, these. This, this legislation or these two pieces of legislation were, were uh, years in the effort uh, and in the making and um, especially HDR1, which I think goes back about 11 years. And so, you know, I come rolling in a year ago uh, and uh, jump on the bandwagon and uh, we have success this year, which really goes back to the importance of elections. The last fall's election and the primary before that were so critical I think in, in putting the right people in place to get that piece of legislation finally through. Of course, it was championed by just some outstanding uh, legislators. So it was a lot of fun to be a part of that process and to, to watch at times when you're kind of thinking it's dead, but then it comes back to life. And it, of course, it did come out differently than I think the, the coalition had anticipated. You know, we were advocating, asking for that 1%. Uh, and then uh, finally, when we finally got, when the bill finally got in front of Senate Finance, uh, it was uh, different uh, amendments were made and it was increased to 1.25%, but then 80% of that would be, would go towards early childhood education. But at the end, what's most important is this, this will now go before the voters of the state of New Mexico and they'll have an opportunity to, to have a say on uh, increasing funding for early childhood education in the state. And I think what's so amazing to me was um, uh one of the things that was amazing to me was the fact that people got so hung up on, on whether or not we could, our, this, this fund could sustain uh, this extra money coming out of it. And uh, even though that myth had been discounted and lots of evidence put forward that that would not be the case. And so it was interesting to watch that. But it was also interesting to watch uh, discussions on, on uh, you know, whether or not there was the need there. I mean, I think everyone thought that the need was there, but is mu putting money at it the appropriate thing to do? Whose responsibility is it to improve the early the care the the situation of ch young children in the state? So, in the end, uh, I think we're all very pleased with what happened. And um, I was worried when, when a certain person was put as chairperson of Senate Finance as to whether or not that was going to be a very friendly committee, and it turned out to be much more brutal. And I think a lot of people anticipated, but it's done. It got through. The other bill, SB 66, did not make it. And I think that came as a surprise to the, the coalition, the Fairland Coalition folks. Um, I think we thought it would get through. SB 66, for those that aren't familiar, it was the, there were a number of bills. There was a companion bill of the House uh, that would that, uh, propose capping short term loans at 36%. Right now, the cap is 125%. And that's actually down from 475%, I think, a year, a, a, two years ago in 2019. And um, um, we ran into trouble towards the end. I, th I think we all anticipated the power of, the, of, the, of that industry in the state and the 
the um, the influence it has in in certain well, I'm going to be just bold, so bold to say with certain legislatures, and uh, so we anticipated that it would really have a hard time. Uh, we thought probably would have an easier time in the House than it did the Senate, but it, it it was reversed. It kind of flowed through the Senate and it got stuck in the House. And in the end, a number of amendments were made uh, in um, in one of the final House committee, which bumped the uh, interest rate up to 99 percent for uh, for loans under eleven hundred dollars and then 36 percent above that. And the Senate folk, the Senate sponsors were just un, were not willing to accept that. Um, and uh, and so it went into conference committee, I think the last day of the legislature and um, and it failed there. Uh, our understanding was the House was simply unwilling to budge the a number of uh, five women, five female legislators got together and, and came up with they th what they thought was a, a good compromise. And, and, me, and they did raise some very good questions in terms of uh, that emergency access to, to small dollar loans and whether or not that would be available across the state. And some very compelling stories were shared by legislators, which were, I think, uh, really important in, 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 in it getting amended up to that 99%. Um, and, but um, in the end, it died. Uh, we'll we'll work on this next year. We we have a lot of work to do, especially with some of the legislators who we thought were who would be in favor of the bill, uh, but who in the end um, came forward, especially with uh, with these stories of how is this money really accessible in these small communities to folks who need it in an emergency, and um, so. Um, as it remains, it's 125%, uh, and um, we'll work on it this next year, and hopefully come back in, in the fall in, the, in January and and go at it again. Um, so, I'm not sure if there's quite any more questions on the details of that, but uh, I guess I'll, I'll end by talking. You know, I was asked to talk some about uh, the faith-based advocacy, the role of faith-based advocacy in this in the legislature, and. I got to thinking about that today and really got down into the weeds about what it could be and what I ought to say. But really, it's in some respects, it's, it's pretty simple for us. Uh, when we when I think about faith based advocacy, I think about it on two levels. One, uh, at the legislative level with the, in the legislative process and what our role is there uh, as a faith based organization. I think we're the only faith based organization in Santa Fe on a full time basis. I know the Catholic Church has uh, um, Alan Sanchez is the representative for the three bishops, uh, but we also uh, speak on behalf of the New Mexico Conference of Churches, which includes the three dioceses and uh, the mainline denominations in this state. Uh, but I think the, the first thing that, that I'll say about what our role is, is to offer legislators a different uh, lens, if you will, from which to look at the various issues that we face in the state. Um, and that, um, you know, there's this. If we, we want to take poverty as an example, uh, there's uh, there is the perception on the part of many that uh, folks who are living in poverty they are there for their own because of their own decisions and their own poor their own poor decision making ability, and therefore it's their fault, and 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 therefore we have, as a, a government we have nothing we have no role in in that. It's it's their own doing. Uh, and yet, um, of course, the church thinks very differently about that. And, and, and the, the truth is, it's not the case. Uh, it's much more complex than that. Uh, and uh, so one of my roles, and it was, of course, made more difficult this year because we were not in person and I have not really had the opportunity to develop uh, more individual relationships with legislators, but is to offer that different lens. Uh, and what, what was interesting, I, mean, I don't, I don't want to get into the weeds, but we saw how People's view of poverty changed in the last 40 or 50 years, from the 60s and the and uh, President Johnson's great uh, you know war on poverty to the 80s and 90s, when Americans' attitudes had changed from changed to, or more Americans' attitudes had changed to. You no, know, it's their fault. Poverty is an individual's. Uh, just, they're there because of their own decisions, and therefore we, the government doesn't have a role. And so we saw lots of our welfare programs deeply cut in the 80s and 90s in the Reagan and, and Clinton administrations. And uh, so our role is to, is to share a different lens from for which legislators, for them to look through about the, the issues that we face in this, this state and about the people of this state and their individual stories. Tim and I had this experience just very briefly, it's a perfect example of this, when uh, there was a bill to connect SNAP benefits to WIC 
Yeah, remember that, Tim? <laughs> and I just happened to see it on the docket, so I stayed and was, spoke against it. But, but it was very clear that the sponsor of that bill had a certain vision or a certain view of what people who rely on SNAP benefits, what they're like and the decisions they make. And it was an, it's an incorrect view and it's, uh, it's an unjust view. And so Tim and I very quickly tried to, in my one minute or two minutes, offer a different glimpse of that, a different lens for which those legislators to look through. Uh, and um, thankfully the bill was, was shot down pretty quickly tabled and didn't get any farther. But that's an example of that, where we're a voice for a different lens uh, to look through. Um, let's see what else did I wanna share. Uh, I think we're, we are, as a faith-based organization, we're uniquely uh, positioned to challenge uh, legislatures and to, to, ask, to ask those hard questions. I think that was the beauty of, 2000, of HB 207, was that it was posing, it was putting before the legislatures hard questions uh, it, to consider and to think about in terms of solving the issue of hunger and poverty in the state. And so we're in a position to, I think, um, to ask those questions and to challenge them to, to answer those. Uh, I think uh, like all um, lobbyists, if you will, uh, our role is to provide uh, great data, accurate data, trustworthy data and information to legislators. And we work hard to do that. And I think in the end, uh, the last thing I'll say about the legislative level is uh, it's all about the relationships and, and my role as an advocate to, to build those trusting relationships with, with legislators on both sides of the aisle uh, and so that, um, so that we are a voice of, of, um, of morality, if you will, of doing what's right. I mean, I had quite a few legislators over the last year remind me or tell me or share stories with me about my predecessor, Ruth Hoppen, who was there 20 years, and about how she was, for many, the moral voice in that legislature, legislature because of her position in the, in, the, in the Lutheran advocacy ministry. And so I think that's part of our unique role as well, is to be that moral voice and, and to be in one of those many voices of, of equity and justice in the system. The second level, and I'll just do this really quickly, has to do with congregations and members. So I work at the state level, legislative pro state departments, legislative process, but also work very closely with congregations, our ELCA congregations. There are, there are Lutheran bodies that are not as maybe more progressive or who, who see the role of the church in in public policy like we do, but I work with our ELCA congregations and the New Mexico Conference of Churches congregations, hopefully in the coming years, uh, to connect them to the legislative process, both as a congregation, but also individual members, uh, and to help them recognize that, that their calling as congregations were really good at responding to immediate needs and to reacting to immediate needs and to providing you know, food and backpacks and all these kinds of things that are needed in the community. But if that's all we do, we're failing because we've got to go farther upstream and address why, are, why do these problems and issues exist? Uh, fundamentally, why is poverty? Why do we have poverty in this state to the degree that we do? Why do we have hunger? And if we're not addressing it farther upstream, then all we're doing is, is uh, providing aid to the symptoms of the problem. Uh, and so I work with congregations to, to see that they need to move beyond just that responding to immediate needs in front of them, because they do that great. It's the advocacy piece that we need to work on. Um, I think uh, one of our roles also in congregations, as you all know, if you're part of a faith community, uh, or if you have a family, that everybody's all over the map on where they stand on certain issues. And so one of our roles in congregations is to create space for members to come around the table who have diverse views and to, uh, to, uh, um, to, to uh, discern, to study, to, to, to come to some sort of uh, point where they can make a decision individually or collectively about where they stand on an issue. Our ELCA has a whole slew of social issues from which I advocate for or against legislation in this state. But everybody on, in the congregations are kind of across the map on that. And so we bring them, we want to bring them together and we want them to get to have that safe space to discuss, number one, does faith have a, have a voice in this? And if so, what is the voice? And what are they called as members of a congregation to do individually and collectively? Uh, and so, and that's of course, much harder said than done. And that's uh, been very, it's been almost impossible this last year where we're not able to meet in person. So creating that space for people to discern, 
what their action is going to be individually and collectively. Uh, and um, finally, I think it all goes back to a key role for us in this office is, is what many would call uh, developing and growing faith maturity in our congregations, um, such that uh, it's, their faith is not limited to what they do on Sunday, but they view all of their life through this lens of their faith, including how they make decisions on, uh, on, on how they view their neighbor and what they do in response to their neighbors in need. Um, so um, I guess that's, I should probably end there because I can keep going on and on, but uh, uh, Judy, what else, anything else? Uh, the only other thing I can think of is what in House Bill 207 spoke especially to you as, as a Lutheran advocacy ministry director? Well, I, yeah, I, I, to me, it was the, just the comprehensive nature of it. The fact that it was, it was working to address uh, uh, the issue of hunger in the state from all levels and all places. It wasn't just a one shot here or one shot there. And it was trying to address the really complex reasons why we have hunger in this state, uh, many of which Representative Stansbury alluded to. And, uh, and that's, I think, it I was very attracted to it because that's where we as a church need to be. We need to be in that space where we're looking at it from that, from that big picture. Uh, and, uh, and, and how, and, and trying to coax our legislature to do that very same thing and in individual legislators, it was an interesting process to watch, especially in the, in the one committee where, where you did see, even like I mentioned earlier about how people view their neighbors. Uh, it was very clear that there were legislators on that legislators in that committee who viewed people in hunger as well, it's their own fault. Uh, I mean, we had one legislature legislature or legislator in fact say that and uh <laughs> it was just astounding to me that uh that 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 people view the world in that way but it's a reality and so of course making lots of mental notes on what i need to do or what maybe can be done maybe nothing can be done but um i think I, it was really important to us because of its comprehensive uh the comprehensive nature of it uh i think one of the things that was frustrating i think was uh i think some of our legislators legislators just um, have a really hard time looking at things from that big perspective, because uh, it's very complex. There's lots of moving parts and pieces, and, and it's not, there aren't simple answers. Uh, and, um, and so I think, uh, this is my own observation, I think for some legislators, it kind of, it was kind of like, whoa, this is so big. I don't even know if I can deal with this, or, or it goes against my, my own political philosophy of, of um, uh, big government versus, you know, it shouldn't be dealt with on this level. So I don't know if that answered your question, Judy, but. Yes, yeah, it does very well. And um, thank you so much. That, that was very inspiring. I've been with Lutheran Advocacy for many years and I just appreciate that, that presence that faith uh, people can bring to the public square. It's mm -hmm. different from, from uh, sometimes what we see in public life. Yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll just I'll end by saying I, uh, I've been nothing but thoroughly impressed with uh, all the people in the different coalitions we're a part of, and what they bring to the table, uh, some, some of whom are here tonight. Uh, and uh, this state has so many fine and talented people working to address these very complex issues. Uh, and I think, you know, over time we'll get there. Um, but I, so I, a shout out and thank you to all those who are here who've helped me learn a lot this last year about these complex issues. Uh, it's been a, a good partnership and I look forward to continuing it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. I think I'll step in now as far as the questions. Um, my name is Kathy Fries and I work at Catholic Charities. Um, I have to say, I take notes for the Interfaith Hunger Coalition and this was exhausting tonight. There's so much information and house bills this and numbers. So I hope I hope I did a, a fairly good job, but um, I'll always let um, Carlos um, edit those for us. Um, but I wanted to draw attention just into the chat real quickly. There was some, um, not, not, not much in the chat, but um, I believe there was something um, from Scott Button wanted to know if the special election goes like I personally hope will, and you'll necessarily shift to a broader focus 
who will be the leaders in the New Mexico executive and legislative branches who will ensure the HB 207 works get done between now and next January, and who will provide leadership in the legislative in the 2022 session to obtain authorization and appropriations to continue it. And then Melanie um, addressed that saying that um, the work group is working now in partnership with HSD and the governor's office, working closely and hopefully we'll come back to refine bill budget initiative next year. Uh, we have strong leadership from the speaker's office with Representative Ferrari and Ortiz and many, many others, and that she'll continue um, to be involved regardless, and hunger will remain one of the top priorities. So, of course, we thank you for that and for your dedication to hunger. Um, there was also one question on here from Ellen, and anyone can answer, I guess, New Mexico grown. Uh, what efforts come from the PED to improve quality of school lunches using New Mexico grown? Oh, great question. So a couple of things. Um, one, I think because the New Mexico Grown Program now is, is a permanent program embedded in the public education department, a couple of, a couple of approaches to this is um, the leadership cares very much about, about uh, the freshness of food in, in school meal programs. We now have school food service directors. There's actually about 87 school districts that now um, purchase New Mexico ground. They've applied for that funding, that bit of funding, you know, which is now it'll be a little less than $400,000 this year. Um, and um, yet now approximately uh, $1.2 million of purchases are made every year of New Mexico grown into school meal programs, which is, um, and that's the goal. So um, that averages out to school food service or school districts utilizing about 15% of their fruit and vegetable budgets to buy local. The second piece to that is as we are in this, we have a new federal administration, it is now gonna take on what's called the child nutrition reauthorization, which was sort of held, stayed low over the last uh, four years um, and now will be brought back up and that is the, um, those are the federal regulations that school districts have to um, uh, uh, stick with or, or uh, um, are required to utilize around what ends up on the plate. And we've advocated for many years for things like more fruits and vegetables on the plate, a little less of the white things that are on the plate. <laughs> and um, those things will be contested, but yet, um, that is that has helped us immensely at the federal level to help us build out these programs at the state level, and that's not just in New Mexico. Every state in New Me in this in the United States now has a farm to cafeteria and farm to school uh, kind of program, um, of which about mm, 35, 40 states it's now embedded in agencies, so that we do focus on that nutrition and um, and the freshness of it, and that with the seniors. The Aging and Long-Term Services Department, because of the pilot project we did, and then the three counties that utilized that fresh produce, they were ecstatic about how fresh it was, how much longer it kept if they had to keep any of it, um, and the response that the seniors had in, in um, seeing it in their, in their meals and, and getting a chance to eat really fresh product. So I think um, freshness and in, in that kind of nutrition really speaks for itself when people eat it. And students, students care very much about, they really love it and they like the programs and they like being able to be a part of promoting them too. Yep, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, instead of writing anything in the chat, if you have a question at this time, if you wanna raise your hand and ask a question, feel free to do that. Yep, Melanie. Um, thank you. Um, well, I had a, I guess a comment after Kurt's presentation um, and just maybe a thought to put out there for discussion. Maybe I'll pose it as a question for discussion. You know, um, I think the observation that Kurt had about how during the hearing we had in the Ag Committee about House Bill 207, um, I think really brought to the fore different philosophies that different legislators might have or lenses through which they view both hunger and the role of government to um, address the issues that affect our communities. And the thing that always plays through in my mind, um, um, which is something that I often tell staff and interns and things is that you have to inform the mind, but you have to touch the heart. And 
um, legislators are humans <laughs> at the end of the day. It may not seem like it, but um, I think that one of the things that's really profound about having an interfaith um, hunger coalition is that is that faith-based work is about touching the heart and touching the spirit, right? It's about that, that soul work, that heart work. And um, it wasn't just the hunger conversations. If any of you listen to the debates that happened on the floor on any number of issues that had to do with inequality, there were very similar arguments uh, uh, on any number of issues from education to income inequality to you name it, rural development. And, um, but then what I thought was an interesting juxtaposition is some of those same legislators when issues came up where they had a personal experience that had changed their mind about something, they would share those stories and they would take almost the opposite position, um, policy position. And um, we talked about this a little bit in our hunger work group after we debriefed after our hearing, but um, I, I know that COVID will make this complicated, but I think that one of the important things that can be done this year, in addition to doing the policy work, refining the bill, working with HSD and the governor's office, is to work through our networks, um, both the faith networks, food pantries in particular. I know a lot of faith organizations operate food pantries in communities across the state. And I guess my question to all of you is how do we touch the hearts of all of these legislators and help them have those personal experiences that change them so that they can see it through a different lens. And I think that part of how we can do that is by inviting those legislators to come to food pantries and help do food distribution. Because I think it was interesting, I did an interview with a reporter in the New Mexican and he was asking me a lot of personal questions about my own experience, as well as like, what is hunger? And I think as an abstract idea, people think of like maybe bread lines during the depression or something like that, right? Like they don't, it might not even occur to them that their own children or cousin or aunt or parent is going to the food bank because they're having trouble getting their groceries at the end of the week. Like that might not even be part of kind of their worldview of what hunger means. And that what we're talking about is just giving people basic dignity to live healthy lives. And that, you know, it that hunger looks like a lot of different things in our communities and that there's, it's being addressed across all these different institutions and it's not about big government, but how do we stitch together this beautiful patchwork into a functioning food system where everyone has access to food and dignity. And that's where I think the faith community can play a major role in helping to touch the hearts and the spirits of our legislators so that they have those personal experiences to draw from as they're um, doing policy work. So I guess I would put to all of you, if you have the opportunity, is to invite legislators to you know, come and serve at pantries or to um, get involved with the food banks and, and um, with hunger programs, because I think that will I think that will impact our public policy space as well. Very good. I see we have one more question in the chat and it's for Kurt. Kurt, do you not advocate for the Missouri Synod Lutherans or the LCMC Lutherans at Faith Lutheran Church? Faith, I believe is the largest Lutheran church in the state. It's also the church our new APS superintendent attends and just wondering. Uh, yes, they used to be ELCA, but pulled out over um, our stance on um, uh, human sexuality and a gay and lesbian issue ordination. That was the reason they pulled out of our out of the LCA. Uh, no, we do not. Um, the uh, Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Uh, I mean, we all. It's interesting. We all come out of the same roots, and Martin Luther was one of the first and best advocates for social justice and for hunger and for health care for the for the for those of his time but um they don't have the same stance that we do in terms of role uh, of being a public church the elca very much sees itself as being a public church and that uh government has a role in making the lives of its citizens better and safer uh, and that the church has a role and a voice in that as does its members so no uh, we don't and they're not a part of the uh, new mexico conference of churches either um 
I would like to just add on or comment on what uh, Representative Stanbury said in terms of touching people's hearts. I think that's very true. I think you see legislators who you would not anticipate supporting or something, but they do because of they've got some personal connection in the past or a family, something or other that motivates them to, to look at the, an issue a different way. Uh, one of the confusing ones to me was uh, Senator Schneides in SB 66. I still can't figure out why he, he was a lone Republican to vote in favor of SB 66. And I, I never would have anticipated that, but it made, made me wonder what in his story motivated him to think differently about that issue. Uh, so I think the only thing I wanted, the, the thing I really wanted to say was beyond getting legislators out in, in doing these kinds of things is to hear the stories because that's where you hear the complexity of the issue. That, it's, that it could be about uh, maybe a criminal justice issue or about the, the jo a job issue or a training issue, all these other kinds of things that, could, that, that impact hunger or cause, help cause poverty. And that's where you begin to understand that, no, there's, there's more to the, it's almost like a root knot, you know, a root ball uh, that we have to address. And, and that's where I, I wanna get legislators to that point of understanding that complexity and being motivated to do something because of that, so. Um, before we end, are there any more questions you wanna raise your hand? We're almost out of time. There was a nice message in the chat from Pam and, and definitely thank you all for your efforts, your work, your prayer, everything that goes in to hoping that we can eradicate hunger in our state. So we really appreciate that. Carlos, do you have any closing words you want to say? Yeah, I just wanna say again, thank you to our, our participants, our three panelists, some three great people that I respect entirely. And also I just wanna let you all know that um, some people for some one reason or another weren't able to come. So this um, session is gonna be made into a, a YouTube video that you can share. Um, share the wisdom of our panelists. I, I um, keep your eyes open for our next Interfaith Hunger Coalition Zoom event. We haven't decided on what it's gonna be yet, but many of you are on our, on our um, list, our MailChimp list, and if you're not, uh, drop a note. Um, uh, you got to the, to the same place where you RSVP'd and we'll add you to the list. Again, I want to thank all of you for being part of this and, and I wish you all a good night. Thank you, Carlos. Thanks. Everyone. Thanks, Carlos. To see you. Mm -hmm.